The longer I've been taking photos, the longer I've been searching for a way of giving them some useful life beyond merely existing as a stupidly large collection of images on my stupidly primitive collection of seven external hard drives. After a lifetime of accumulating photographs and in a world entirely awash in trillions of unloved photos, those shots amount to nothing more than space on hard drives. Endless, meticulously catalogued, keyworded, tagged, picked, flagged, rated and edited photographs that nobody except me gives a flying fuck about. While photography is therapy to me, and while I love being out in the landscape, I could, let's be honest here, have got my outdoors therapy by just going for a nice walk now and again. But instead of that, I have a quarter of a million photographs I'm too stubborn to let go of. I was struck one day by the meaninglessness of all that work that all the hours I put into going out into the world and capturing never-to-be-repeated moments were proof only that I don't know when to stop. But what if I could give those photographs a purpose? What if they could be something more than a distant memory for me or a forgettable throwaway share on a social media platform? What if I could put them to work? After sitting with that thought for a while, a stupid idea took hold and it wouldn't let go. What if instead of posting these photos into the void, I built something genuinely useful around them? And so, armed with optimism, ignorance and the phrase, how hard can it be? I decided to build an iPhone travel app just so my photographs could finally justify their existence. and. Somehow, this ridiculous idea is now a real iPhone app on sale in the App Store. Turns out, if you spend several decades photographing the same stretch of coastline, you accidentally become a bit of an expert on it. Where to park, when to go, which beaches are overrated and which ones are overlooked. Where the best coffee is and who has the best pies. All that local knowledge was sitting in my head with a supporting cast of a quarter of a million photographs. And so I thought, why not package them together? Now, as anyone with ADHD will tell you, having the big idea is not the problem following through with your amazing plans is the issue. And it has to be said that when I began, I awarded myself a very low chance of actually completing this project. But the words of my long-suffering wife, Catherine, were pinging around my frontal lobe like a haunting monastic verse bouncing off the vaulted ceilings in a cathedral. For God's sakes, Andy, just finish one thing. So, I made a plan, and it was this. I would make an iPhone app. Not because I have anything against Android phones, but because I have an iPhone, and because realistically, trying to do both platforms at once was an absolute guaranteed way of fucking the whole thing up before it even began. So iPhone it was. The next part was figuring out how to build it, how it would function, where the data would come from, and how it will be served to the lovely members of the public. After a heap of Googling and some fairly extensive chats with Claude, Gemini and GPT, the BGs of the large language model world, I had a master document from which to work. We'd make a database first and populate it with all the necessary fields and tables, and then stick a bit of dummy data in there to be used during the development. Now, I must confess, I have a bit of an advantage in that regard because me and the missus run a boutique design agency. Boutique means me and her and a couple of regular freelancers. And we have our own proper web server located right here in Australia. So I had the infrastructure all ready to go. I won't bore you shitless with the technical details, but the broad strokes were that it would be a live app which was referred to by coders as full stack. The stack being an app on the top layer, a backend database in the middle, and an admin panel on the bottom. 
rather than embedding all that data in the app and then having to update the app every two weeks because something had changed, all the data lives on our web server and can be easily updated, tweaked, added, or deleted from a web browser. Working with the AI coding model, we divided the project up into initial nine phases, but that eventually became 12 phases because I kept thinking of things I wanted to add. That's called feature creep. The database got built in phases zero and one, the pipeline between the database and me in phase two, and the actual admin interface in phase three. And as it turned out, the database part of the whole business turned out to be the easy bit, far and away the easiest bit. It was now time to move on to the iPhone side of the process. And to do that, I had to use an Apple development app called Xcode, which would house the app and enable me to test it. The actual process of coding the app went like this. I'd fire up the terminal on my Mac and boot into one of the AI coding tools, either Claude by Anthropic or Codex by OpenAI. I would tell the AI to read the documentation that I've made the system meticulously craft so that it could get up to speed on things. And you have to do this because the AI coder is basically going in blind every day. They all have a strictly limited amount of context, which is their memory, and when it runs out, they have to compact everything and basically work from abbreviated bullet points. So it pays to have the system document everything it does as you go along. Oh, and side note, it also pays to set up a proper backup system too, because these AI systems, as capable as they are, can and will fuck things up. Early on in the process, I created a repository on a site called GitHub, and every time we made a successful addition or change to the app, I would commit any code changes to GitHub. And then when it went to shit, as it badly did on many occasions, I could roll back to the previous working version and start again. So I'd fire up Claude or Codex and occasionally Gemini. And once I had read the documents, we would crack on with whatever step we'd arrived at in whatever phase of development we were at. From a practical point of view, I'm basically just along for the ride, and I spent a stupid amount of time watching walls of gobbledygook scroll up inside terminal windows. That gets old very quickly, and so what I actually did was get on with something more productive while the AI coder was doing its thing, and every five minutes or so on, check the terminal, see if it needed to provide more guidance or approve changes or test something, and then I'd set it off again. The database side of things took me about six full days of coding time spread out over about three weeks. My ADHD hyperfocus might have been firing all cylinders, but let me tell you, friends, you really need to take regular breaks from this stuff because it does your head in. In fact, there were moments where I'd had enough of some thorny issue that I left the whole thing the fuck alone for several days while I waited for my enthusiasm to return. At a couple of points, I almost threw the towel in completely, but the words of my wife, for God's sake, Sandy, just finish one thing, always came back to haunt me. The iPhone app side of the process took up about 90% of the whole development time and amounted to about 85 full hours of AI coding. Bear in mind that those 85 hours are the accumulated totals and don't account for all the testing, tweaking, and research and dead ends. The actual time frame from start to finish was nearly three months. If this sort of project appeals to you, then I should also point out that while I am definitely not a programmer, I do have a decent understanding of the way coding works, and this proved invaluable in spotting when the AI coder was disappearing up its own ass. So finally, after aging myself by about a decade, the app was basically done and playing well with the database, which meant it was now time to put all the data in. Now, in this regard, I actually had a bit of a head start because I'd written an ebook called The Complete Guide to Jervis Bay couple of years beforehand and I could repurpose great big chunks of that content in the app. 
In terms of features, the app is split into multiple sections, information listings, events, collections, and things to do. And I began by adding all the informational stuff. The first stage of data was the 40 beaches you can find in Jervis Bay. Then I added the places, towns, and villages, followed by natural attractions, lookouts, picnic areas, fishing spots, etc. And then places to stay, campsites, hotels, motels, and tourist parks. I had a lot of fun picking out the photos that I wanted to include with all those listings. In the process, I rediscovered images I hadn't looked at in a decade and which would have remained a random collection of ones and zeros on a hard drive had I not given them a new life. From a technical perspective, I was greatly aided in that process of hunting down photographs by the GPS data in most of the photos, but also by the keywords that I'd added to them. Even so, there were gaps, and in fact, I had to make several day-long trips back to the bay to take photographs for important listings for which I didn't have sufficient coverage. One of the great things about having a live app is that you can have an up-to-date events listing section, and I added all the local events next. In my system, events can be made recurring on a very flexible basis, such as the first Saturday of the month for things like farmer's markets or specific dates or date ranges for things like museum exhibitions. The bit that took the longest was adding in all the shops, cafes and restaurants. There are more than 60 cafes and restaurants alone and I had to add summary text, address, GPS coordinates, email, website, social media, price range, opening hours and photographs for those and all 300 of the other listings. It was an absolute slog of a job, which I got through mainly by working my way through many TV shows and films, which have remained unwatched on Plex for years. So finally, all the data entry was complete, and with the app now built, I could finally submit it to the Apple App Store. I did a heap of reading and found out how to construct an App Store listing, which of course involves creating those nice-looking screenshots and marketing text. Now, I had been warned that submitting apps was a total ball ache, and I went into it mentally prepared to put up with whatever small print I would inevitably fall foul of. But as it happened, I only had to make one change. My app enables you to log in with your Apple credentials and save itineraries within the app or share them with friends. And the app was initially rejected because I hadn't added an account deletion option. So I added that feature, resubmitted the app, and amazingly, it was accepted and went live. We were now in the run-up to the Christmas holiday season, and here in Australia, that means most of the country is tools down for about three weeks, and very little happens during that time frame. But I did manage to sneak in an order for a 1,000 A5 flyers with our regular printers, which I intended to drop off with many of the businesses I'd included in the listing. Rather nice, isn't it? I also reached out to the tourism department of my local council, hoping for a bit of support, but actually they were the opposite, aggressive and negative. The council would offer me no support because they saw my app as being in competition with their own promotional website. True story. Once I picked up the old AI flyers, I drove down to the bay and called in on many of the businesses, and they were all, without exception, impressed with the app and thought it was a great idea. I also emailed about 70 different media organizations, hoping for a new story or two, but I didn't get a single response not even from the local newspaper who runs stories about jam competitions. So that was a bit of a blow. I plan to try again with them all in a few days' time when they're back at their desks. The $64,000 question is, of course, was it all worth it? But in order to answer that, we need to define what our terms are. Worth it in terms of effort I expended, in terms of skills I picked up along the way, in terms of creative writing in terms of giving my photographs actual real world purpose in terms of income firstly as someone who is very much on the spectrum it was exceptionally pleasing to finish the project and to satisfy 
my long-suffering wife's one and only request. In truth, I didn't think I was going to cross the finishing line, and I think we were both amazed as each other that I actually did. Secondly, yes, it was brilliant to be able to give my photographs a new purpose. There are some unappreciated shots in there that I really love, and it makes me happy to think about visitors to this region who might see those photographs and be inspired to explore those places themselves. Thirdly, the process of making the app gave me a lot of confidence in the process. Since I released the app, I've built several bespoke WordPress plugins for our design company's clients that have been very lucrative. And it's looking like I'm going to be building a couple of much smaller, simpler apps for clients during this coming year. Fourthly, has it been a success from a financial perspective? If we're talking about the skills I learned and the knowledge I was able to apply to do that other work for our clients, then 100% yes. But if we're talking about sales of the app, then while it is early days, it's only been live on the App Store for three weeks now, the answer is no. As I record this video, I've made the grand total of 10 sales. There are a lot more users of the app than that because I gave many of the businesses promotional codes in the hope that they'd pimp my app. But so far, only 10 people have actually bought it. I fucked myself a little bit in that regard by launching so close to Christmas when everything shuts down here. But I just wanted it to be in the store for when all the tourists and visitors flop to this region for their summer holidays. The good thing is that the vast majority of information in the app will remain current with no updates required from me at all. So there's no reason why it can't continue to pick up sales for many years with very little effort on my part. As to whether it will ever be a big success, I don't know. But I can now consider building an Android version and perhaps a desktop browser version since I can simply tap into that huge database I built. Looking back, there aren't too many things I'd have done differently, but I'd like to have known beforehand how frustrating the process is. There were many moments when I used an extremely choice range of robust Anglo-Saxon language with those AI models. So now that the app is built and live, you may be wondering if it's worth tackling a similar project yourself. And to that, I'd say that as long as you're prepared to put in the hours, it's definitely worth it. The AI companies would have you believe that anyone can make an app, and up to a certain extent, that is true. I also know that without the knowledge I already had and the infrastructure I already owned, it would not have been able to release my app. You don't have to make things as complicated as me, of course. You could build a much simpler little app that utilizes your photography in some way. Doesn't even have to be a travel guide. Doesn't have to be that clever. It could just be a small, opinionated thing that gives your photographs somewhere to live other than a folder called 020512. That's the real power of vibe coding, I guess. It lowers the technical bar just enough that ideas get a chance to exist. And if you're anything like me, that's the real win. Not the app, not the sales, not the downloads, just finally finishing one thing and giving all that work a reason to be there. And that will do us for this look at my journey from idea to app store. Have I inspired you to go off and make your own app now? Or would you rather disembowel yourself with a spoon? Do let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. And if you got value from it, consider subscribing to my channel for more photo, video, and the drone related content from me. Till the next time, legends. Ta ta.